What happens when you give nutrient-dense, locally grown fruit and vegetables to people suffering from severe diet-related diseases like diabetes? Even though we might not know all the details of how nutrients get from healthy soils into our bodies, that shouldn't stop us from getting better diets to people in need now. The savings are enormous, but how do we finance it? What is holding insurance providers back and why haven't we seen any outcome-based structures being set up? Where's the first social impact bond, which isn't really a bond, but still in healthy, nutrient-dense food? Join us today in discovering how a program in Tulsa, Oklahoma is trying to prove just that. Healthy food grown in healthy soils lead to healthier people, especially people with diet-related diseases like diabetes, who run an enormous risk on kidney failure, strokes, and much worse. Making sure they get access to healthier fruits and vegetables and cooking classes dramatically reduces these risks in as little as 12 months. What are the connections between healthy farming practices, healthy soil, healthy produce, healthy gut and healthy people? Welcome to a special series where we go deep into the relationship between regenerative agriculture practices that build soil health and the nutritional quality of the food we end up eating. We unpack the current state of science, the role of investments, businesses, nonprofits, entrepreneurs and more. This series is supported by the A-Team Foundation, who support food and land projects that are ecologically, economically and socially conscious. They contribute to a wider movement that envisions a future where real food is produced by enlightened agriculture and access to it is equal. The A-Team Foundation are looking to make more investments and grants in the space of bionutrients. You can find more here, ateamfoundation.org, or get in touch directly, info at ateamfoundation.org, or check the information in the show notes below. Welcome to another episode today with the director of Fresh RX Oklahoma. Fresh RX Oklahoma sources local and regeneratively grown nutrient dense organic vegetables and fruits to program participants while stimulating local economy by supporting small and local farmers. There are a lot of very interesting buzzwords to unpack in that introduction. So I'm very happy to have Aaron here on the show to explain more about Fresh RX and what role it plays in this transition. So welcome, Aaron. Thank you so much for having me. And Start with the, to start with a personal question, we always like to ask at the beginning, what brings you to the space? What brings you to, to use those, those buzzwords, regenerative glow, regeneratively grow, nutrient dense, organic vegetables in uh, a sentence like that, especially around health? Like what brings you to, to work on the health and the soil side of things? It wasn't really a direct path like most people. I don't have don't any worry, we, have, we have had many wandering stories on the, the first half an hour of this podcast, so please take it away. I bet. Yeah, definitely a wandering story, but definitely a direct connection after really learning about it. I come from the background of long-term care, so I worked with predominantly older adults. My master's is in gerontology, the study of aging, and it was through really seeing the systems of aging, what food people had access to how many prescription drugs they were on, how many chronic conditions they had. And looking at that from a very serious pandemic standpoint, diabetes is skyrocketing. By the time you're 50 years old in the United States, you have at least one chronic condition. And 65-year-olds in the United States are on an average of 15 prescription drugs per year. And so it wow. was learning this, going through different levels and working in different levels of care for older adults that I really saw that food was the thing that people were eating most of the time, ingesting into their bodies. And I really didn't know anything about regenerative agriculture, but I traveled to Italy. I am sensitive to gluten and dairy, but I could eat a whole pizza there and be fine. And so I thought, it's got to be the food like this is but this did is you dare issue. to try because that could also be you travel you travel to italy and you say no but i i'm i'm sensitive so i'm not even trying what made you try <laughs> well i could tell that things were a lot more fresh and i had kind of learned that just through different people i had talked to and just the general understanding about food systems a little bit at the time but i really hadn't dove into regenerative agriculture and it was really funny because um, I was actually dating a ex-husband of a woman who was running Kiss the Ground at the time. And I just knew her as like a fellow co-parent and I just really admired her work. And I had asked her if I could get into the soil advocacy program 
So I went into that program not knowing that had any connection with my work, funny enough. And of course, very quickly after reading a lot of science, I really connected longevity, successful aging, human rights to regenerative agriculture. And I was astounded by the connection between soil health practices and nutrient density and how that would affect someone's health and quality of life. And then... I mean, seeing that connection, I mean, we've, we've had, uh, actually at this time, it's uh, probably Finian, the interview with, with Finian of, of Kiss the Ground is mm -hmm. out as well. We've had Lauren on the show um, somewhere yes. last year, and uh, which I'm guessing is the connection there. And But then going from, because many people have gone through that program, and then turning that into, of course, it changes you on a personal level and, and on your, but turning it into work is 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 often a step or, or and like, how did that happen going from, okay, this, now I'm, I'm equipped with this knowledge and and how do I put that to work or how do I, I do something with this, with the tools that I now have? Sure. So at the time I was just seeing one-on-one -on -one clients and so it helped them kind of change their lifestyle. A lot of them would come off all of their drugs and get better, but I really started putting it to work during the pandemic, believe it or not. In 2020, there was a lot of needs in the community and a lot of needs and systems that had been cracked before, but the pandemic really showed us the additional cracks and how big the cracks were in all these systems. And so food and access to food was a major issue. And I started volunteering in Tulsa, predominantly the North Tulsa area that is a food desert, didn't have a grocery store for 14 years. And that was a major need. And I saw kind of what organizations were doing what and what food was available. And it still was terrible food. And I was really sad that we would be giving terrible food to people who have chronic conditions, which would be making them worse. And I thought, and these are people of color, low income, like how deserving this is to people. And so uh, there was a doctor in North Tulsa that wanted to do a produce prescription program for his clients in North Tulsa who have uncontrolled type two diabetes. They were compliant. They would come to their doctor's visits. They would take their medications, but their diabetes was just still getting worse. It was uncontrolled. They were at incredible risk to have a stroke, kidney failure, death, or an amputation, and they really needed assistance. And I was asked uh, by that clinic and by some other community members to fundraise for a program called Fresh RX. We based this off of several other studies and programs that have been done in the United States. There's been about 200 done. Geisinger study was the one we based ours off of, which was a combination of local food uh, or fruits and vegetables and education. But I said, if we're going to source food, we're going to do it locally and we're going to do it regeneratively. And people said, good luck. Uh, you'll never be able to do that. And I was like, good, I like a challenge. And so be because it wasn't July, able, they, they didn't believe that you could find it or that it would be too right. expensive or both. Both. Yeah, it'd be too expensive. We wouldn't have it available. We definitely wouldn't have had it available year round. Uh, but we have, we have found it and we've created a cohort of farmers. We have food year round every two weeks. We haven't stopped since July of 2021. Wow. And so just to paint a picture, because we've had some interviews and then it sort of stopped there, like, okay, let's just go for local and organic, but then that regenerative and soil piece seems to be, I wouldn't say missing, but it hasn't been part of many of these prescription, um, uh, right. let's say diets or boxes and, and for a while, like, what do you felt like was missing? Like, isn't it just good enough to go for the locally seasonal and organic and then sort of stop there? Why did you want it to push um, further, let's say into the soil piece? And, and is that really changing something? Like, isn't like, are we, aren't we getting like 80% there with, with, with the, the seasonal and organic stuff? And, and is the soil piece so fundamental? Yeah, I, I learned a lot and being in now speaking at a lot of different agricultural conferences, I really saw that even in certain studies uh, by David Montgomery and other people with the Bionutrient Association with Dan Kittredge, I really saw that things that were grown from good soil, whether it was organic or not, it's a really holistic system. So if there were just no tilling and doing organic, but they don't have any other holistic practices, it's not as likely that it would be nutrient dense. I also wanted to stimulate local economy at the same time, but I wanted to support farmers who were treating the soil well. And it's also carbon capturing more, so it's affecting 
the climate at the same time and animal health. And it's definitely creating, I think, a healthier microbiome in the soil and in our guts. And so I do believe that uh, regenerative food tastes better even than organic, that it's more nutrient dense. That's my belief based on the things I've read and learned and from seeing the food and tasting it myself. Taste test is the number one test for sure. And we have been told time and time again, we have the most beautiful food that tastes the best. And I do believe that our food will be higher quality than what is found in a Whole Foods or a Sprouts um, and definitely better than anyone that our program has access to, which mostly is from a Walmart and things like that. Yeah. So what is the program if you had to describe it? Um, you said you mentioned every two weeks we have year round food. Um, for whom is the program and, and what does it entail? Fresh RX Oklahoma is a produce prescription program. It's where doctors actually prescribe fruits and vegetables. They are looked at to find people who have type 2 diabetes who are North Tulsa residents. We have the highest rate of diabetes in the entire state of Oklahoma in that area and the highest mortality rate there. So that was the diet-related disease that we started with. We're going to be broadening that to do prediabetes and other issues, but that's just what we started with. We started with 52 people for a 12-month period. So people who have type 2 diabetes who live in North Tulsa, they get free food for 12 months. Every two weeks, they get fruits and vegetables. And they also have correlating recipes that go with that food. And then we also have cooking and nutrition classes, about four opportunities a month for them to go for 12 months. And we do a, a lot of data metrics. We are looking at several different things from food security to healthcare utilization, but we're also measuring their health metrics, their A1C, their weight, and their blood pressure. And we measure that every three months so we can see how people are progressing. In our first year, we had some really incredible outcomes. And so now we're seeing 100 people. We've doubled the size of the program and most recently have been funded for the next three years through the USDA NIFA uh, grant for the GusNIP Produce Prescription Grant. So we'll be on the national level uh, contributing that data to move the needle along with these programs. And so, I mean, it's a natural bridge What or a natural follow-up question. You, you said we have some, seen some very incredible results in, in only 12 months, uh, which, which is a lot of time and nothing at all in, in a lifetime. So what... What stands out or what are some interesting things that you might not have expected when you, I mean, of course you expect people to get slightly healthier or quite a bit healthier, maybe lose some weight, maybe some diabetes impact, but what did you, what, what surprised you? Yeah, so many things surprised me. Our goal originally based on other programs was to reduce people's A1C by one to 2% in the year. That would equate just to for, 16. Yeah, just for, for complete new reason. What, what is, what does that mean in plain English? So a, um, hemoglobin A1C is, is really a way they measure uh, where you are with your diabetes. When you have diabetes, you have an A1C level that's over a six, and that's kind of the pre-diabetes area. Then when you get up higher, uh, you have full-blown diabetes. When you have uncontrolled diabetes, it's at an eight. And so that's really severe. At an eight, A1C is where you're your chances of being having kidney failure, stroke, all these things skyrocket, and they actually stop measuring at a 14. So it's measured all the way from like five as a normal up to 14. So we were seeing people in the 11s, 12s, 13, 14s. So that's the high end of the spectrum. So you can see when it's measured just to a 14, a one to 2% reduction is huge. It's actually equated to 16 to $24,000 per year in healthcare cost uh, prevention and savings by one to 2%. So our goal was to at least reduce it by one to 2%. We would love to have people that were at a 14 fall below an eight because it minimizes those risks for those catastrophic health events. So our goal was one to 2%. Our average of the people who had a reduction in our program, which was about 36 people out of 50, uh, they had some type of reduction in their A1C, and their average reduction was 2.2%. And we had the largest reduction was from a 14 to a 6.9. And that was only in six months. Some people even came off of their insulin shots and were able to take kind of less intense medications and kind of taper off. We had people who felt less anxious, less depressed, who started new healthy relationships 
the ripple effect was just enormous. We estimated that with just 50 people, we saved the state of Oklahoma nearly a quarter of a million dollars, and it only cost us about $150,000 to do it. So uh, you invest 150 grand and save 750. The ROI makes sense to me. Absolutely, yeah. And and so now you go to a hundred and and mm. other and and slightly earlier in this in the spectrum as well. You mentioned pre diabetes. Does that have to change? Like, what did you learn? Sorry, on the produce side. Like, do you, are you making changes there as well in terms of what fits better to to get those numbers down? Let's say. Um, you know, if something is grown healthy and it and it's grown in healthy soil, it's going to be nutrient dense. It's going to have vitamins and minerals. We do. Uh, make sure that we have a plethora of variety of crops so that people are getting a well-rounded diet as far as their vegetable selection. Uh, we have uh, improved on our culturally appropriate foods because obviously some people aren't interested in certain things or they'd love to see, uh, for example, our clientele really wanted to see collard greens. And so we commissioned a farmer to grow those for us where they didn't, the farmer had to have no reason to grow those because that's not something typically someone would buy at a farmer's market necessarily um, in our area. It just wasn't available. And so we are just trying to get better at offering more things that people are maybe familiar with while also really showing them new things that they can try and how to do that. And then we're also limited on what we can grow here and what's easier to grow here. I try to get the farmers to do certain things. We provide a lot of support for them to have high and low tunnels so they can kind of change seasons. And so we're trying to get better at uh, diversifying the crop selection and just really making sure that the farmers are supported in their soil health practices. We do use the Haney test to look at some of the uh, soil at, on some of our farmers. Some of them are regeneratively certified through soil regions process and making sure that they're continually building their soil organic matter. Because the more you have of that in the soil, the more likely the food's going to be more nutrient dense. And so that's really been a big concern of mine as we move forward. And in terms of like for a family or a person, like how much of this is going to be their diet? Is it a full, like what, what are you targeting to replace? Because obviously you come, many will come from quite a poor diet, but, but at the Walmarts, et cetera, of this world and, and the shift is going to be enormous. Like, is that a, a, a one, a zero to one shift or is it 50% of their diet or a hundred or what do you, um, are you nudging them? Like, okay, this is, this is what taste could look like and, and. Um, expanding on that because of course they're not living by themselves they're living in families in many cases like what what are you yeah, doing we, there to to make sure that yeah it, it's we're not trying just a to nice help to have. them yeah we're trying to help them definitely make better choices when they're shopping and outside of the food that we provide uh, we definitely want them to be eating at least half their diet and vegetables we help them change their habit, but really the intention and other studies have proven that if you just increase their consumption of fruits and vegetables, we're not really tra tra changing their whole diet. We're just increasing their consumption of fruits and vegetables. And through just simply increasing that and increasing their knowledge, they definitely make different choices, but we're not telling them, you know, you can't have meat, you can't have dairy. Uh, we just want them to have more fruits and vegetables in their diet. And that's been proven to be to have direct impact on these health outcomes, whether they really change much of their diet or not. A lot of them are working with dietitians to make sure that they're quitting drinking soda and things like that. So some of them have already made those changes. They're still making those changes. But our job is really just to increase their knowledge and increase their consumption of fruits and vegetables. And, and then what have you... How different is it now? Like, could a program like this, especially with the focus on regen, have happened five years ago? Or is it uh, because it seems to be bubbling around this theme, specifically on the health side? I mean, there are conferences popping up. There's like, do you see that because you're in the trenches? Do you see that as well? Is, is it, does it feel different around the healthy soil, a healthy human connection compared to a few years ago or, or maybe even longer? Or is it uh, also, it's just shifting a bit, let's say, in our little bubble? It is, it seems to be 
really kicking up speed for sure. I don't think it would have worked five years ago. I don't know if we would have had as many farmers available using these practices or that they would even be aware of these practices. I think it is the right time at the right place. And I really saw that opportunity. And I still think we're kind of on a bubbling of additional bridge building from region to healthcare. That kind of, it's been building in the agricultural world, I think for a little while. And it's now just starting to poke its head over to healthcare. And I see that growing at rapid speed too. I think there needs to be more conferences on healthcare connection to regenerative. I know there's a few, but there's definitely room for more. I also feel like in the regenerative agriculture conferences that we're kind of speaking to the choir a lot of the time. And I'd really love to get more access to be bringing up regenerative agriculture to other organizations that they it would connect to in some way. I have been fortunate to speak to the Kansas Governor's Public Health Conference. So I talked to 500 public health professionals and it was brand new concept to them, but it was impactful and it was people that haven't heard it all the time, not just the same regenerative ag farmers kind of talking amongst themselves. I mean, that's good to have support and community, but yeah, I think it's growing quickly. I think it's the right time and right now is the time. I think we really need to prepare our food system and have more education and access to that so we can continue moving forward. It's still a small amount of people, I think, but I think it's multiplied vastly in the last five years. Absolutely. And and what do you open with when you're like talking to 500 health professionals that are, that hear this for the first time and this, I mean, the whole soil story, I mean, you can spend 10 hours on that only. Like what, <laughs> if you have 10 minutes, what do you, what do you, how do you hook them and how do you at least, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I've, I definitely, they know what the rates are of these chronic conditions. And I really start by telling my story and telling them that, you know, people deserve access to healthy food and, and really show how regenerative agriculture creates that nutrient density and how that impacts. And a lot of them know a lot and understand about nutrition and diet. I think people question whether people are willing to do it. And so I'm able to use this program when I'm speaking as an example and say, you know, I was nervous, too, that we'd be forcing this program on people, but we're not. People are starving for this information. They know it's life or death and they actually don't have access and they don't know what to eat. And when we give them the tools to do that and not everybody, but a lot of people, I was elated to see how many people were continually committed to the program. We had 40 out of 50 people the first year stay in the program for the entire 12 months. And that seemed great. I think there's a community element outside of that. And I think that uh, just having some passion and just some quick understanding, I don't go into a lot of super details about soil, but I do help them understand that there's a continuum of nutrient density, by the way, in different crops, like the blueberry is not the same blueberry as another blueberry, they all um, differentiate. And so I established that and am able to draw connections and they know how sick people, how sick people are, and they know the systems aren't working. They're inside of them too. But I, I, I speak very um, uh, lovingly and passionate about that and that, you know, it's just stuff that we didn't know. And a lot of surprisingly or not, a lot of the public health professionals there at that conference had uh, grandfathers or husbands who are also farmers. And so they really got it. And so I've been fortunate enough to, to be able to kind of read the room and make those connections when necessary. And what would you say um, if we would do this interview live, let's say in, in front of a room of a very different crowd, uh, but a financial world and, and investors that are starting to get very interested, obviously, in the regen piece, um, the healthy yep. soil piece, but also that healthy, um, healthy human connection. What would be, of course, we don't give investment advice, but what would be your your main <laughs> message to them um, after uh, when they leave the room? Where should they dig a bit deeper? Where should they learn more? Where should they um, listen? What would be your main message or your main takeaway to a group of, let's say, financial professionals or people looking to put money to work? I love this question. I think that's kind of the next step and people are trying to figure that out right now. I do think there's a viable investment model for this type of program. And it's really the holy grail, which is getting the insurance to pay. And if you have investment money and you have relationships often because of that, 
you can have relationships with insurance and you need someone who's an operator who knows what they're doing like myself. And if those relationships are connected and the insurance is willing to pay, I do believe that, um, you know, they would be willing to pay and the cost savings that you could prove, you could even uh, get a contract going where they would give you back some of those savings to continue the program. But their cost savings will be huge. And with the model of healthcare moving into a more value-based and outcome-based model, because it's going through that transition right now, it's not going to be fee-for-service. Every time you go to the doctor, they get paid. It's going to be based on outcomes and values. And one of the pieces of implementing that shift is penalizing hospitals for readmissions within 30 days. And so these hospitals, these managed care insurance companies are going to be very interested in programs that are going to save them money and they're going to be willing to pay and they have the budget to pay. And so I do think that there's venture capital opportunities to make those relationships, engage an operator like myself and really create a viable business model to not only make money, save the healthcare industry money, and also help people have incredible quality of life at the same time and stimulate local economy and agriculture. I mean, what would be a better investment? And, and so when you talk to these insurers, or it's, it, it always seems the holy grail, everybody's like, okay, who's, who's picking up the bill? It's definitely the taxpayer and the insurance companies and probably a combination of both. Um, right. We haven't seen many movements there. Like what, what's holding mm -hmm. them back? Um, you must be talking to them or meeting them. Them is a very vague term, obviously. But what's yes. holding the insurance <laughs> world back to, to start backing uh, prevention and, and this kind of care? Because we've seen it in, in surgery um, in the Netherlands where they do fit for surgery and they, they save a number of hospital days afterwards and a lot of complications, which are very expensive with a simple high protein diet and a lot of training before you go into a very heavy surgery. I mean, all of those examples, there are quite a few there. And then somehow it doesn't seem to hit, <laughs> let's say the boardrooms of insurance companies. Like what's, what's holding them? Back? I know I, uh, you know, don't I they want to of, save money? Like, yeah, I think, you know, I think it's also, it's individual beliefs of whether they believe uh, we've kind of downplayed how big a role nutrition is on people's lives and healthcare cost savings. I think that's, there's an element of that, you know, the people making the decisions, whether they have a healthy diet or not, and they know the ripple effect of that. Um, and they definitely, I wouldn't say know what regenerative agriculture is or the impact of that. There's still not a lot of studies that are proving this. You know, one of the big questions I get is, well, would the conventional fruits and vegetables make just as much of an impact? And that's a big question. I can make a meta-analysis and I can say, well, if it has more nutrients in it, your brain's going to be satiated and it's going to tell your body to stop eating. So I would say that it does have a direct impact, but a lot of those studies haven't been funded, haven't been established. There's still just a few studies out there that kind of lean towards that truth. So I think it's just we're going to have to have a lot more established studies, and that's kind of the way it goes. But the Fresh RX Food is Medicine mission has been pretty decently established. And so there is a group called the Food is Medicine Coalition that are lobbying and working on these things. There has actually been a federal pilot that has been approved. And so I think it's just a domino effect from there. Like Medicare and Medicaid have already started paying for something called medically tailored meals for people that get discharged from the hospital. So they're not necessarily locally sourced, but I know that Food is Medicine Coalition has intention for that. There's a lot of providers in that group that do grow their own food. I don't know if it's regenerative or not necessarily, but it could be in a lot of ways. It could be. And so I think it's just a domino effect and other insurances are going to look at what other insurances have done it. And it's really going to take like the first one to take a big chance. There has been state waiver programs through state Medicaid for people who are low income. There has been waiver programs passed for the state to pay for these programs. So there has been a couple that have been done. And I think it's just as it's going to have to have wider adoption and then it'll really push forward. And it's really just a matter of time, I think, before that happens. And do you, do you see that? Like, will we see, we're recording this at the beginning of 23. Um, will this be the year where we see the first insurance funded program? Or is that like, is that a few years down the line and we're still in the, still between brackets, still very important, but the pilot phases of many of these. 
It could definitely be this year. Okay. It could definitely close. be yeah. this year. Uh, if someone has the relationships and they're willing to do it, it could happen any time. And cost savings are ready to be had. So any time, um, it may take another couple of years, but I wouldn't be surprised if if we got a contract with an insurance company this year and just started moving that way. And, and is it going to be, is diabetes like the ideal candidate or are there other um, I wouldn't say lifestyle diseases, but other um, diseases that can be yeah. easily, like what are other hot ones yes. for you or interesting ones for you? We say, okay, the connection with food and lifestyle is so strong. We can have really high impact. And also it's a disease that really is, is uh, let's say, costing a lot from, from the social side, but obviously also from the financial side. What are beyond diabetes, yes. what are other exciting ones? Yes. It's a weird so word to use with disease, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. I mean, I, I would argue, you know, obviously for anybody, good quality food is going to have some type of impact. But as far as the diet related diseases that we really want to go after are high blood pressure, hypertension, can there's a huge, huge uh, button right now. Also, uh, heart disease, people are admitted into the hospital because of heart disease. And that's a big, big ticket item. And that can absolutely be driven very specifically by diet. And we've also seen people who really would like to see better programs for nutrition for cancer patients at the same time. So that is going to be something that we're looking at or trying to help people create a program for that specifically. Um, but really any healthy food is going to be helpful in any chronic condition. Um, and your body will just be better supported to try and heal itself. And I always say the body is a self-building house if it gets what it needs and not too much of the poison, then it can really um, heal itself in a lot of ways. And so uh, those are just a few of the, the chronic diseases that we've been looking at. And just flipping the conversation and, and the chair, like what if you, you would be in charge of a billion dollar investment fund and um, you're in the middle of the, the trenches, but also in a, in a space that seems to be exploding uh, where would you put it to work and, and what would be your priorities if you had, I wouldn't say unlimited resources, but a significant sum to, to be put to work in an investment way? Absolutely. I can do something with that. I would put a fresh RX local chapter uh, in every major city and create rural programs, uh, which would be a little bit different model as far as distribution and things like that. But I would set up a rural program. Um, in every state, in a local chapter, in every major urban area. And then I would also create the infrastructure that would also benefit the local food system across the nation and even across the world. Uh, it, may take, it may take about a billion to do something like that. But um, I, as a result of running this program, it really showed us the breakdowns in our local food system and what things we would need to scale and grow. And so really it's having hubs, regional food hubs, and having produce prescriptions kind of programs in every little state and city and going forward. And, and that, that could take a billion bucks. So we could, we could definitely do something great with that. And you, you sort of alluded to that before on the contract side or the outcome side, we had this wave of uh, they were called impact bonds or social impact bonds, which is the wrong name yes. because it's not a bond at all, but it's an outcome-based contract, especially around, I think it was around a prison system in the UK yes. and a number of yes. programs uh, have been funded, uh, basically paying for a successful outcome to an operator like yourself. It always sounded that this model would be perfect for food and ag. Perfect. Have yes. you seen any work around that? Like, okay, it, it mm -hmm. usually... Successful um, operators like yourself that were basically got, could raise financing and then had an outcome-based payer, if you were successful in this case, reducing the 50 patients to 40, et cetera, et cetera. Um, have you seen any, um, with a better name, hopefully, because Impact Bond is not the name, uh, but have you seen any work in that, like, like outcome-based um, funding schemes where you could actually raise the money to, to do this work? And if you were successful from risk-taking investors, if you were successful, you would be paid and also the investors would be... Uh, having an, an, an interesting return capped in many cases, but interesting return. Has that been done at all? Is there talks about that? Yes, I'm glad that you brought that up because actually Oklahoma has been the first state in the United States to not only use it for that model, but for other social systems in Oklahoma. 
So we looked at New York, who did a prison system, and we started that with the Department of Justice here in the state of Oklahoma. And we've now used it for foster care and other uh, supporting other nonprofit works that would benefit and save the state money. So we do have um, a couple groups in Oklahoma, one called Meta Fund, who we've been talking to. Uh, OU, the University of Oklahoma, did a study on us and really connected us with them, thinking that we have such good health outcomes that they would have to, con- they would just have to, as a fund, convince uh, Oklahoma State Medicaid to pay them back, essentially, and so they could give us money. And I think they're still uh, working through the kinks of that. But I was really impressed with that program. And it's, ca- I was trying to find what it was called. Impact investing is what they kind of uh, call it. And they have several different programs, but they basically, yes, they pay nonprofits to create health outcomes and they get the state or the state entity, whether it's Department of Justice or a Department of Human Health Services to pay them back. And it's a great example of that is say there's a nonprofit that helps people uh, keep uh, custody of their children so they don't go into foster care. And so they do an intervention program. Well, the money we would budget to foster that child now goes back into that nonprofit to prevent that from even happening. So that's a great example of how that works. And they can do the exact same model with a produce prescription program without a doubt. Yeah, so we can wait for for somebody to put those three entities. Basically, you need the operator, you need somebody to pay. Or in some cases, it's a, it's a foundation or a nonprofit or uh, it's somebody right. that saves the, saves the money. And, and somebody to check the outcome, obviously, and see the control group and, and things like that. But in prisons, it have, has been uh, very interesting for people basically funding a program to make sure you don't go back, which is an extremely expensive from all sides of the, like social, financial, like if right. people go back into prison. And there are many very successful but very underfunded nonprofits uh, making sure people land on their feet, get housing and work, etc. And right. of course, saving an endless amount of money. But if you don't connect those dots, it's never going to go. And this sounds exactly the same, just replacing food yes. with prison, basically. Yes, um, exactly so the same. I, I'm waiting yep. for, yeah, yeah, I'm waiting for programs like this. Unroll. Maybe not, I mean, we've also seen examples. I know some investors that invested, I think, in a program in the UK. And then it was so successful that it was adopted as state a policy at some point. And the investors were bought out. So it was good. But at the same time, they, they, yeah, they had to figure out another way or another place to put their money to work. So they had the outcome. They even had the return. But of course, it was also the last time this investment had been done because it became state policy, which is yeah, what you want. Which so it's is a stepping positive. stone. Yeah, it's a you stepping want stone that. Change. And the in- investors have the relationships to, to really influence change like that. And that's what I'd like to see uh, more of on this produce prescription model. Yeah, but I've been surprised that it's been 10 years we're talking on, on social impact bonds and we haven't seen, or email me people if, if you, you know of programs, but we haven't seen a lot around food in this way, which is very interesting. No. But maybe now the time yeah. is, is I right. I think Oklahoma that. will be the first to do it. <laughs> yeah, you were leading, in the, our, our you are leading in the prison really, side. Yeah. Yeah. The fund here has um, done more than other uh, outside of just Department of Justice. We've done that program here, but they've been the first to apply it to all policy and all departments. And so they have yet to apply it to uh, a produce prescription model, but I know that they are working on that. Super interesting. And what would you change if you had a magic wand and you could change one thing overnight? So it could be anything in food and egg or not food and egg related could also be uh, give pe- people better taste or or etc. Like, what would you change if you had a, a magic wand and could change one thing? Wow, one thing. Um, I would insert the understanding of importance of food and health that that be one and the same in people's brains <laughs> and the and desire to really yeah. care about yourself. Yeah. Is that something that is like you've seen, of course, with people that haven't had the the chance or the exposure to to food, like and also taste and flavor, because in many cases we're used to very salty, very fatty, very sweet, and and bringing in fruit and vegetables. Have you seen like how quickly taste can be sort of reprogrammed? We we talk about that, but we don't really like. like have you seen that that like it's sort of innate in us to to want the the quality and the taste that in this case you're bringing to households. 
Um, and it's not something because you were scared. You said I was scared that we had to force it to them. Like we're forcing this new food or these different foods or we're forcing stuff that might not be as sweet as your soda bottle or as, as some other things that are in the fridge. Has that been yeah, the case or what have you learned there? People's taste buds do change. I mean, I would think for the most part, you'll want something, you know, not good for you every once in a while, but I do think that as you eat healthier, it does change your taste buds. I've seen it with myself. I've changed my diet to a more plant-based diet. Um, and I used to eat a lot of uh, kind of fast food type things when I was like a teenager in early 20s and changed my diet. And I could tell just for myself that uh, the taste buds do change and that your habits do change. And then I think that when you have a healthier diet, you also have a higher consciousness in some way where you can then... Uh, do deeper work on yourself because it's like if you're constantly inundating yourself with low bri- vibrational foods, then it's also going to have a p- effect on your mental health. And so you're not going to do as many positive, healthy things or be as productive. And so I think that changing your taste buds by eating healthier things can actually be a ripple effect to a lot of other healthy, holistic healing changes in yourself. And for me, it's a it's a ripple effect. It's a great entry point for people to come at. And even if they don't want to start with healing their emotions or healing other things, that we can start with food. And that's a great start. And then maybe if they're feeling better, they'll be more apt to do additional productive things in their life. And you mentioned in, in the diet change, we let's just start with increasing the amount of, of healthy fruits and vegetables on the animal protein side are you doing anything there are you um, deliberately avoiding that is there plans or what because that might be still a big chunk of, of diet which can be either replaced with much healthier proteins or much healthier animal proteins as well um, what is your your view on the animal protein side I definitely think that regenerative beef and other meat will be way better uh, than the stuff they're getting. Our program is really based in a certain model and it's a research program. So we only are giving out vegetables and fruit uh, because of how that research is structured. But I do want to see more regenerative meat and protein in our food system. And so I absolutely support those producers in the area and connecting them to, we have an urban ag coalition that I run in Tulsa. And so that really encompasses kind of a wider variety of suppliers and producers. So that's something I definitely want to see in the food system. I think uh, animals and livestock are an important part of this picture that, you know, you can eat a plant-based diet, but also eat healthy protein when you want to eat that. I I have no problem with that. And I want those producers to be equally supported. It's not necessarily a a part of the produce prescription model that we're doing, uh, but it's absolutely a vital part of the larger local food scene. And so I am, we're working on creating a regional food hub here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and they will absolutely be part of that. And we'll really try to help consumers understand why uh, it's such better quality. And, and as a final question, which usually is not the final question, but um, what do you believe to be true about region ag that others don't? So where, where are you contrarian, let's say within our bubble? Uh, this is definitely a question that's inspired by John Kemp. My, oh, let's see. You know, I, I really do believe that chemicals are harmful I think not everybody in regenerative ag uh, thinks that you have to be a regenerative farmer uh, and you can't, a lot of people think you can't use chemicals and be a regenerative farmer. I think that there are some small instances where they may feel like they need to do that. Uh, But I do believe that we can holistically manage land uh, without chemicals and that we really need to lean that direction. I think that that's important. I think that people have valid concerns about the use of these chemicals, and I think there's alternative ways of doing it. But again, the farmers need a lot more support to do that. Um, And I do believe that regenerative food and local food is more nutrient dense. I would say probably most people agree with that. Um, There is some differing opinions. I, 
I, I believe one of the biggest things I will say is I believe that regenerative farmers and people in this field need to be in integrity with their own health. I've been really disappointed to see so many regenerative farmers be so concerned about their soil and their land, but really uh, not be concerned about their own health. And I think that when you are helping with a mission like this is, and really preaching these kinds of things to be believable and for this mission to move along better and more productively and just for yourself and your family that we really need to be treating ourselves like we're treating the soil. And I think that not every group in regenerative ag is concerned about that. I mean, obviously you can make more money being a regenerative farmer and that kind of gets people in the door, which is great. But I think that especially the people running conferences, the people speaking, they need to embody these teachings. And I think that that doesn't happen a lot. And it, it, it saddens me because we need them around too, you know, to continue this mission. We cannot lose and them I to know, diabetes type two. Yeah, no, that would I be... know, I know a lot of these farmers I'm talking to have diabetes or have these chronic conditions or have serious alcohol dependency or drinking lots of soda and having all these issues. And it's like, guys, come on. Like what is keeping you from loving yourself and respecting yourself? I mean, we at least have access, a lot of us to better food. So I don't, I feel like it's hard though. People, farmers are working hard. And so obviously sometimes it's easier for them to go get some fast food. And I get that it's not easy, but I'd really like to see that uh, be something that, we get closer to as a community. So we need to get a, a regenerative subscription model specifically <laughs> focused on the operators and farmers in the space that mm -hmm. don't have time to cook or, but that should know better. But yeah, we all understand that sometimes it's, it's not easy and make sure they're around for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Yeah. This we is a love long, you guys. We need yeah. you. <laughs> That's a very good point. And then, I mean, you, you mentioned that we commissioned to the farmer, to a farmer to do this and this and, Obviously, you said uh, regenerative farming is is more more profitable from a like a payment perspective. Like, why would they work with you compared to selling it on the farmers market? What what makes you uh, an interesting apart from all the health outcome and of course a very interesting uh, story? What makes it interesting for farmers to work with you? Yeah, they have a reliable wholesale model to sell to, where they don't have to go sit at the farmers market and be there all day, it's a lot easier for them. I also allow the farmers to dictate their price. So it's not gonna be you know, Walmart wholesale prices. It's gonna be somewhere in the mid range um, between not retail prices, but a wholesale price that they get to dictate. And if they have any overages or anything we can't give out for our program, we'll still buy everything they have because we have a way to sell that to our local food bank as a result. So they don't have to have any uh, nervousness about over harvesting or things going to waste. We have become kind of an aggregator locally and we pretty much are buying everything we can get our hands on that's local and regenerative. And we make sure that it gets sold and that they have a reliable market. And if they want to grow new crops, we're willing to help support them. We are starting to do more of, instead of just buying their extra food, we are commissioning them in kind of a CSA model so they can get 50% up front and have upfront cap capital to pay for seeds or whatever they need. I had a farmer tell me yesterday that because she had her upfront money, she had her farm truck was going out. And so she was able to fix that and she wouldn't have been able to. A lot of the farmers said that they would not have survived the pandemic if it wasn't for our program. And so we've actually been able to get four of our farmers have uh, hoop houses funded through the NRCS this year, through our advocacy and technical assistance. So we really take care of them and they can feel more confident to grow and to scale and to try new things and to have a wholesale market they can depend on. So it's a, and, and it's very interesting. I mean, you, you mentioned the diversity, of course, but are you starting to look into like, but it's of course a diverse group of farmers. Like, what what if they grow differently or a different crop into your program would have that? Would that have a different health outcome? Or that's completely not, um, um, let's say, identifiable identifiable yet. It's just like let's make sure that the patients get a very 
um, diverse uh, set of fruit and vegetables and, and as diverse as possible. And at some point we might start looking at certain kale or certain cauliflower or certain whatever is more impactful, but that's just not doable yet. Like what, what do you, because you don't tell them what to grow. You just get whatever you get your hands on, you know, you can, you can place it somewhere. Yeah. I've really considered that. I've really considered testing the farmers. Like if one is growing kale, the other is growing kale, whose is more nutrient dense and kind of going down the rabbit hole of that kind of testing. And I'd love to, formulate or amend the soil in a certain way that it creates the certain more nutrients that maybe diabetics need to have more of. It's really a question of just being able to get fresh food and get people to even eat anything um, at this point. Uh, but I do think that it potentially, I think the larger market is really going to start looking at those things. And then that's going to determine which farmer they want to buy from. I'm really excited for consumers to be able to be empowered to know which farmer grows the best spinach. And then that could really inform us as we go forward on, on what we want to choose. But right now it's, we're just kind of getting everything together, but yeah, I've, I've been really interested in, in how we could get more specific for different chronic conditions and amend the soil for one better for cancer and grow certain crops that would uptake those certain um, those certain elements that people need for those chronic conditions. So not quite yet, but definitely interested in that. And if anyone out there uh, knows more information about that, please contact me. Perfect. Yeah, I think there there's there's work being done, but it's very it feels very early on that to be yes. so specific. And and I think I don't remember if it was in the health nexus or the healthy food nexus of Croton Institute, which I will link below, or it was David Montgomery mentioning it somewhere. Um, like mm -hmm. the fact that we don't know everything doesn't mean we should not act and we know diversity helps. And right. so let's cover, right. I think it was the health nexus. Let's, let's make sure we get as diverse as possible because then we know you get everything in, even though we might not even have a name for the certain micronutrient or phytonutrient we need, etc. So let's, let's first get the diversity in and then we can um, it doesn't hurt, that's for sure. Exactly. So let's, let's make sure we move there. And we start from such a low point in many cases, uh, most of our <laughs> yes. diets. So let's let's not let's not focus on the super. Let's just at least cetera. eat some vegetables. That would be a big step. But yes, I'm excited to see it's very early on with that. And and I've heard of some people that do uh, look at some of those things. And I'm excited to further connect on that research and and how we can move forward with that. Yeah, thank you so much for, for taking the time. I'm very curious to to keep following this. Obviously, um, also after the series ends, we'll, we'll be doing more and we'll keep uncovering uh, the connection between healthy soil and healthy people. So thank you so much for the work you do and for taking the time to, uh, come, to come on the show and talk about it. Yeah, thank you so much. And if people want to connect with me, I'm sure you'll list it um, on all the platforms, but just if people listening... You can look at freshrxok.org and then my larger mission uh, with all the different work I do at consciousagingsolutions.com. I'm on Facebook and Instagram and uh, Aaron Martin or Expert on Aging or FreshRx Oklahoma. You can find me all over. So please reach out. Uh, FreshRx Oklahoma has a YouTube channel. So if you want to see some of our cooking and nutrition classes, we'll have more up. We just started that. So please follow, like, subscribe, and join us. And I will definitely link all of that below. So thank you so much, Erin, for your time today and speak to you soon. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links we discussed in this episode, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash posts. If you like this episode, why not share it with a friend or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps. Thanks again and see you next time.